The topic is, is, of course, very, very wide, and I'm, I'm looking at that from certain angles, not, of course, covering everything. My own specialty is really building information modeling. I have been working now in the development of that for about 20 years, and, and that is, in a way, the context that I'm speaking about, the sustainability and how, how, the, how those two things are related to each other. We all, of course, know that the uh, definition of sustainable development, that, that sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is the foundation of, of, of sound development in the world, and, and when we think about uh, how important it is, when thinking about the, really the extreme uh, weather conditions that we have nowadays more and more around the world, it's, it's really something that it's, it's a burning issue. Uh, I think, in a way, this was a very iconic photograph that changed the way that, that we are seeing the world. I remember very well myself, I was 18 years old when, when the man landed to the moon the first time and we started to really see how small our planet is. But uh, the way that we live nowadays is, is really uh, over doing that, overusing the, the resources that we have on the earth. If you think about the European Union life, lifestyle, it would require three globes if everybody would be living on that level. US, and to my understanding, so Australia is about on the level that, that we would need five globes to, to sustain that, that living. And of course now the question mark is, is when we think about China or India, how the population is growing there, how the, the living standards and the expectations of people are, are growing. We can't simply go on the way we, uh, we have been uh, living. And on the other hand, we can't expect that the Chinese and Indian people would accept that we would say them that they are not entitled to, to have the same level of standard that, uh, that we have. So we really have to think about what to do about that. Anyway, we are speaking about, let's say, more than 40% of the energy that we are using is related to the buildings. So it's, it's actually the biggest energy consum consumption in the world. And also, it's uh, one third of the greenhouse gas emissions are, are coming from the buildings. This means that, that we really have to take the, the challenge of, of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions very, very seriously. We are wasting construction materials on site. As you can see, 2 to 3 percent of the uh, construction costs are way because of material waste. And this means that about 10 to 15 percent of the material on site are wasted. And in the end of the day, 28 percent of, of the, 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 those materials in the UK are becoming waste. So, for, as you see, 420 uh, million tons of materials and, and then construction is delivering 120 tons waste every year. And landfill, it's about one third again. And then when we think about the, the, how we are using our labor force, uh, the, the waste is even bigger. There are again a little bit different figures, but this is coming from Chuck Eastman from Georgia Tech, claiming that the value added work on site is 10% of the time of the people working on site. More than half of time is wasted, and then the supportive part is, is quite big. Compared to other industries, we are doing really, really badly in that. And when thinking about uh, our commitment to the, the carbon reduction, uh, this is uh, UK's commitment uh, globally to, to reduce the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, when you look at the, the figures, it's dramatic a challenge that we are facing in that. When you think about what has happened now since 2010, uh, we definitely are not on the, on the line that where we should be. It, we haven't been as efficient as, as we should, which means that the challenge is getting harder and harder all the time. It means that we have to do quite a lot also with the existing buildings. So it's, it's about the renovation, refurbishment, not only the new buildings that are, we have to start thinking, rethinking how to, how to do that. 
Then when I move to, to, to when I'm using the, the term BIM, I think that, that it's, it's worthwhile to kind of define a little bit what I mean by that because there are different definitions and, and also to my understanding not everybody here is necessarily expert on the, the construction industry or the, or the information technology for the construction industry. One way to, to uh, define BIM is that is the representation, virtual representation of the, the building. So it's really the end result of that uh, building information model. But it can also mean building information modeling, meaning that the process of producing that information and, and uh, also managing that information. Personally, I like much more about the term building information management because modeling is actually a relatively small part of the work. It's, it's the part where we are creating the information, but when we think about the life cycle of the buildings, management of that information already in the construction phase is actually much, much bigger effort than the, the, the modeling. Also in the, the model, there is one problem. Many people, when you start speaking about the, the building information model, they, they immediately think of 3D model. And many people really think that 3D model and BIM are synonyms, which they are not. Really, it's, it's much more about the information. So, personally, I think that, that it might be worthwhile <laughs> changing the terminology so that we would start speaking about asset information management. The reason for this is that the infrastructure people don't easily understand that BIM is also something that, that is important for them. Of course, we are not thinking when we are speaking about the roads or railroads or power lines that they are buildings. They are built, definitely built environment, but asset information management might be the best term when we speak about that. And really, the, the emphasis should be on the information, not on the model. That is my personal view that, that we really, it's, it's much easier to understand the, the content of the, the BIM when thinking about the information centric viewpoint to that. One reason that why we started to develop BIM a long time ago, of course the, the idea itself is, is really old. Uh, Chuck Eastman wrote his first paper about BIM already in 1975, so the idea is not something new. The implementation into the practices is, is much newer. And, and when we started the national uh, BIM program in Finland, which I was leading 1997-2002, this was one of the basic images that we were using. The problem was already then and, and still today largely that, that we, even though everybody is using computers, we are exchanging the information quite often on, on documents. And even if we are sending electronic documents, they are really documents, meaning that they are human readable. And when we send them to the other participants in the process, it means that people have to recreate the information from the documents into their systems. And it's not adding value in the processes. Instead of we have a very good possibilities to, to create new errors, and also it's, it's very time consuming. There was a study in, in late 90s in UK uh, claiming that every bit of information used in the construction process is recreated seven times during the process. So it's huge waste of work that, that we are doing in there. And the basic idea of, of integrated BIM process is that, that we are producing the information in a format where the data is directly usable for other software products. So instead of having the situation where the architectural drawings are given to the quantity surveyor who starts measuring the things from there, we can really get the quantities directly from the model into the, the cost estimation system. We don't have to recreate that, which of course makes the, the process much easier, especially because we have so many changes typically in, in the construction process. However, construction industry is, is facing one really big problem. Our industry is not easy to change. It's, it's very difficult to change the way that, that we are working. And as a consequence of that is, is that these well-known figures that, that really the uh, development of productivity in our industry has been very bad. In USA, actually negative. In Finland, slightly positive, but very little compared to the other industries, and exactly the same situation as can, you can see also in UK. There was a small uh, improvement in the early, early 90s or mid 90s, but 
then after that it has become to the same situation again. And this is definitely something that we should somehow be able to, to solve that, increasing the productivity. Also, one of the strengths of our industry, our ability to start new projects very flu fluently without any, any major arrangements, has become actually a problem. When I, earlier, when I was speaking with, the, let's say, people from the, the information technologies, they were really admiring our uh, ability to start a new project. Everybody knows exactly what is his role, what is expected from him. But now when the, the technologies and the processes are changing, this is actually becoming a hindrance. It's, not, it's preventing us to see really what is really needed. We are so stuck in the, the, the old-fashioned way to think about that we should be producing these drawings in this scale at this stage, but we are not thinking about the information flows and contents in the processes. So this is one of the big challenges also for the education, how to get people to understand what the processes should be. We go beyond the, the old way of, of documenting things. And uh, because we live in a uh, project-based uh, project industries, it's, it's very difficult to make this kind of changes that are affecting the different partners in the supply chain. You can't really be very efficient in the changes unless the whole supply chain is changing. And it's very challenging to do because what is the incentive for all companies to change at the same time? So systemic innovations are very difficult in industries like, like construction. Uh, in addition, the way that our clients typically are procuring the services is low bid. They are dividing the process in small pieces and buying the lowest bid for every piece, not seeing the, the really how much friction and, and problems they are creating in the interfaces between those different phases. So this means that, that in fact, we are having a situation where everybody has to suboptimize their work. They have to minimize their own workload to be able to survive with the fee structure that we have. And this is then leading to the situation that if the total cost of the buildings are higher than they should be. So we are not optimizing the buildings, we are just minimizing the work at different stages. It's, it's really something that quite often I'm using the, the comparison that if somebody is building a football team, nobody thinks that they can build a successful team by buying the, the cheapest players in every place. Why would we think that our industry is different? How can you expect that the lowest input is producing the best outcome? That is something that is a bit, a bit mystery to me, that how people think that way. And of course also one of the things when we think about the BIM and, and its usage, it's, it's a method which is bringing quite a lot of benefits to downstream. We are producing information which is more usable and more accurate, but what is the incentive for the designers to do that? If we, we don't change the business models, why would you take more responsibilities of the information, producing more information, more accurate information, unless you get some business benefits from that? This has created a business environment where it's quite crucial that, that our industry gets a wake-up call. Somebody has to kind of put the situation such that, that this is changing. And typically what, what is happening all around the world is that they, usually the wake-up call is coming from the public owners. In 2007, both GSA in the United States and Senate Properties in Finland started to require BIM in a very different way because they were looking at that from their business viewpoint. GSA started from the spatial program validation because the problem was that the buildings often were bigger than, than the actual program and which meant they were more expensive and they didn't have the money to build them. Then they have been expanding later on to the other issues like energy performance, operations, circulation and, and security. So our property started to look more kind of a bigger picture of the process so that, that they made the modeling mandatory for the whole process, uh, for the whole design process at, at the first stage. But last year, uh, actually, Senate Properties guidelines were transferred into um, uh, national BIM requirements in Finland, and now they are covering the whole life cycle of the, the information, starting from the requirements until the, the uh, use and, and maintenance of the buildings. The only part that is at the moment missing 
is the building permitting process, but that's also under preparations. Uh, and as you can see, there are also other owners like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Coast Guard, or Danish Enterprise of Construction Authority, and, and Staats Group in Norway that have been adopting this thing. Then, what is happening at the moment in, in UK, where I'm working at the moment? It's quite interesting uh, change that has happened there. I started almost exactly three years ago, in, in the beginning of May 2010. And when, at that time, I started the preparation of our master's program, BIM and Integrated Design, many of my colleagues in Salford, but also in the industry and, and other universities were commenting something like this, that industry needs people who can make drawings. Nobody is, is using BIM and industry is not interested in that. So we can't start teaching. It's too expensive, too complicated. Which, of course, was quite challenging. That, but nevertheless, we were able to, to continue the, the development. And luckily so, because then in October 2010, Paul Morel made this very famous statement that in a conference in London, he said that, that government will start demanding BIM. And it was really government. Paul Morel is the chief construction advisor for the UK government. And he made it very clear that, that this is going to happen. Not exactly when at that point, but the statement. Uh, what happened then next was, of course, the typical reaction from the industry. This is 10 days later on the same website, an architect saying that, basically, that Mr. Morel, you do your job, I'm, I'm doing my job, and as a designer, I decide when I'm starting to use BIM and how. It's quite an interesting attitude that you are telling your customer that they can't tell you what they want. It's, it's really strange when you start thinking about what, what this means. But what was very unique, I have never seen, in, not, not in Nordic countries or in, in USA, that immediately all the big industry associations started to be on board. I don't know what is the, the real reason, but I suspect that the reason is that the construction industry in a very bad shape in, in UK, con public construction is a very big part of that, and the association saw that this is a lifeline. This is a way to stay in the game that takes the ownership of them. And very actively they started to participate. There are a huge amount of different work groups uh, defining the, the details of this, this governmental program, Paul Morel has later on said, that, said about this that, that when he made his statement, it was a bit like when Kennedy was saying in the early 60s that we are going to be moon, in, in the moon by 1970, that like Kennedy, he didn't know how to do that. It was just that he wanted to make it clear to the industry that this is going to happen. Then uh, in May 2011, uh, government was publishing the construction strategy. It's not only BIM strategies, it's wider than that, but as a part of that, as you can see, government will require a fully collaborative 3D BIM with all pro project and asset information, documentation, and data being electronic as a minimum by 2016. So now there is a clear timeline when industry has to be there. So all public projects will be there. As a consequence of this, the change in, in UK is something that I've never seen anywhere else. It was so rapid. In two years, my, my own estimation is that the uh, UK was there somewhere between Italy and, and uh, France. And, and, and speaking about the maturity of, of, of the industry using BIM, and now it's number two in Europe after Finland. And in Finland, uh, people have been using these technologies for a long time. So it's, it's really quite amazing to see that a big country like UK is, is changing so rapidly. And also now, uh, uh, Francis Maud, from uh, Minister from Cabinet Office, is saying that UK is becoming the world leader of BIM. They see this that, that as a tool to increase their competitiveness on the world market. And uh, from the, uh, David Philip, who is the uh, person responsible of the, the practical implementation of this program, this is one of his slides where he is saying that BIM has woken the industry up. Personally, I would say that it's, it's really UK government which has woken the industry up. So it it's really has been a very, very strong message to the, the industry. Good question, of course, is that why? Why is government saying something about the technology, how you should be designing and delivering the buildings? What is the reason to go on that level? 
And uh, there are a couple of reasons. First is money. These are now Paul Morell's uh, slides that I'm, I'm using. And first reason is really the cost of construction. The other one is uh, sustainability. So the government is feeling that, that they are in a way between the cash and carbon. They have to do something, and, and the question is that what? What should we do so that the construction industry will start delivering the, the uh, carb low carbon future for the society? And then we don't have the money, we have to think. It's also quite uh, different compared to many, many other countries is that government is not putting much money into this development. They are really urging the, the industry to come on board and, and start developing. So they just tell where they want to go and they expect that the industry will be responding to that. And of course then the, when, when thinking about this uh, challenge of the low carbon, the first question is that is the industry fit for purpose? And as we know, it, it's, it's not very good. Our industry is, is not very good in changing, as I said earlier. And one of the things is really the fragmentation. These, this is just listing some of the organizations in UK. And when getting everybody on board, this is quite a problem of selling the ideas to the, the industry that, that you really get the acceptance of, of different uh, associations. Then, of course, we all know that, that in our industry, the, one of the big problems are the silos. We are really looking at our own professions and our own companies, and uh, really this kind of holistic thinking is missing from, the, uh, from our industry. Another problem is that, that we are organizing projects so that we are distributing the risk lower in the, in the supply chain. And th this means that it's, it's, it's very difficult for the small companies who are the, the suppliers. They finally are carrying the biggest risks and they are the least, least capable people to do that. But then, and then we are very bad in, in carrying the information through. So we can't really, uh, when, when we are moving from different phases of the project, uh, it's always the information is disappearing. And, and this is really something that, that we should be able to change. So the question is that how can we really persuade our industry to change? What is, what is the carrot that I think is, is good enough for that? In a way, I think that in, in the UK it's actually, a, I would say, that combination of carrot and stick. On the other hand, the carrot is that, okay, if you can do this, you will have work in future. And on the other hand, the stick is that, that if you can't, you will be out of the business in the public sector. And uh, what Paul Morales has been listing there, that, that we need innovation. I, personally, I absolutely agree with that, because our industry is, is very good in reinventing things, but very bad in innovation. Real innovation doesn't happen often in construction industry. Another thing is that we have to really get integrated, and then collaboration. And these are things that, that we really are leading to the situation, that if you want to achieve this, you have to start using different methods, and basically it's, it's BIM. When we look at the cost implications, this uh, from Macro Hill uh, Smart Market Report, this is very clearly showing uh, how much the collaboration can start reducing the costs. And, and this should be something that the owners should really see that, that this is a big issue, that, that when, when you move from the traditional 2D projects into the collaborative BIM, you are cutting the change orders very dramatically. When, when we think about the typical profit margins in our industry, this is really very big change. And when you can expect that you can save something like 15% of the, the project costs, why are the owners not more interested in this in, in, uh, in, in our world? That there are very few owners still who are pushing this. And uh, uh, then from that, government came to this hypothesis that as a client, government can derive significant influence in cost, value, and carbon performance by using this open shareable asset information, meaning BIM. And then there are these different aspects of that that they have been emphasizing. So how the work has been now developed is that, that the first step was, in a way, starting to, to 
uh, map that into the current way of work, in plan of works, looking at what the uh, government is calling the data drops, meaning what information should be delivered at the different stages of the process. First, of course, for the decision-making purposes, and then in the end of the process, it's, it's really the asset management uh, information that it's needed. And at the moment, there are several pilot projects ongoing, testing the, the requirements, refining the requirements. So at the moment, it's, it's still a concept, and of course, it's interesting to see how well the whole industry will be moving. It's, it, to me, it's, it's clear that there will be a lot of companies who are going to be on the stage that they can deliver this by 2016, but I doubt that the whole industry can do it. The uh, education and training work group of government uh, was calculating that we should re-educate 150,000 companies, 3 million people, to get the whole industry on board. My question is that who is going to educate the educators for that? Because even if all universities in UK would start doing it, it's not, we don't have the capacity to do it. It's just a fraction of people that we can educate. So it's a big challenge, but on the other hand, of course, also an opportunity. Then uh, these, uh, the work is, is going to more, more and more detail, really looking at, at what is the content in different data drops. And there, there are quite a lot of good ideas in that. And personally, I like, for example, this, this one, that really concentrating what you really need, not asking everything. This was actually something that today in one meeting we, we, we were discussing about that. It, typically, when you go to the facility management people, tell them about the possibilities of BIM and ask what information you, you want to have. The answer is everything. But what is everything? What is all information that you have from the building? You really have to do, define what you really use in your processes. And this is something that's ongoing at the, at the moment in, in UK. So when going back to the uh, sustainability issue, uh, government has seen that there is a connection, but then what is the, really the connection? How strong connection do we have between the BIM and, and sustainability? I think that the first thing there is that when we really start calculating and, and evaluating the alternative designs in the early, early stages, it's almost impossible task manually. There are so many different aspects, so many complicated issues that trying to do it manually is not very reliable. Way. And it's, 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 even if you can do it, it's taking a huge amount of time to do that. So it's, it's really something that, that we, we have to find tools to do that. And uh, that is a um, thing where BIM provides the tools. So we can, when we get the, the design information in, uh, in, in the BIM format, we can use that for diff in different tools for different assessments and, and simulations. And this picture is, is from Vladimir Bazianak from Lawrence, Lawrence Berkeley. Now, and when you think about the traditional way to use the simulation tools, the effort is to build the model for the simulation. And then you have a little, very little capacity to do the, the actual simulations, especially because you have to then, if you want to modify that, it's easily you have to build several models, and, and it's really big effort. Compared to the situation where you just make a small setup from the existing models and use them in different tools or you look at different alternatives. It's also possible in the PIM environment that you can really for example, for cost estimation, you just map different wall types or different windows to different production methods or different products, and you get alternative costs. The same way in the sustainability, you can look at if I change these windows to that time, what is that without changing the actual model, just cha changing the, the mapping of, of the products to the different things. So this is really huge possibility in that sense that we can start using efficiently the tools that we have. We have had a lot of simulation tools for a long time, but they have not been used in, in most projects. And this is now something that I see changing. In fact, last summer in, in Finland, the energy regulations changed so that if you have a, a cooling system in the building, you have to do a dynamic simulation of the building. That's the only allowed way to get the building permit. 
And even though you might be thinking that it's a very unusual situation in Finland because of the cold climate, but it's not. Most of the modern office buildings need cooling, except on the coldest day of the winter, which are very few. So almost all new office buildings do have the air conditioning systems. And uh, it's has said that it's, it's not only about buildings. We do have quite a lot of databases that we can start combining. And uh, one of the discussions I had once with Martin Fisher when we were flying to one conference at the St. Plain that we were discussing about this idea of BIM. And uh, we were developing a slogan that embed as little as possible and link as much as possible. Because when you have basically just identifiers in the models and you link them with the different databases, you can utilize those databases very efficiently. So it's very flexible environment when you are not embedding all the details into the models, but really using, for, as I said, for example, the wall types and production methods in the database and link that to different walls in, in, in the building rather than modeling all the, the uh, material layers that we have in there. And uh, this is giving us the possibilities to really look at the issues on the, on the uh, larger scale, really the environment, transportation, land development, the city scale, looking at the traffic, uh, not only individual buildings. This is to me, this is one of the, the really crucial things in, in BIM, starting to really combine that with the GIZ information, not just looking at the, the individual buildings. And of course, when you think about the building of the railroads or the roads, this is uh, then of course these, these databases are really, really crucial in that work. But it's also when we think about the building, uh, building design, this is from Kranund, which was my, my previous uh, employer. I was actually the, uh, responsible of the in this integration platform. The basic idea there is that the company doesn't develop these tools, but tries to find the best engines that you have around the world for the simulation, and then just building the missing links that, that it's an integrated platform for the designers. But, and, but it's also it's showing that how complex the world starts to be. In that company, there is no single person that could use all the tools. And of course, you are not using all the tools in all projects. For example, computational fluid dynamics is something that you don't need in, in simple buildings. But when you have something complex like a uh, concert hall or uh, some big uh, sport arena, uh, which is used for multiple purposes, it can be really, really important to, to have that kind of simulations as well. But the possibility to use these tools is giving us the, the possibility to make a virtual building, test the building before we build that. And the, uh, this, in, in that company, the idea has been developing so that you really start from the client requirements, registering them, to, uh, changing them into the, the actual requir technical requirements, all is feeding to the central database. You have the model either from the architect or the company is building that themselves. So they, they have built a system where they have standardized their workflows. They use always models. Then you check that, that you have all the information that you need there, make the zoning, start making thermal and comfort simulations. Of course, it's, it's important not just to try to save energy. We have to also create the, the conditions that, that people are comfortable in the building. Because otherwise, well, you would put any heating or any, any air conditioning system, no lighting, you wouldn't use any energy, but the end users would not be very happy probably with that. But the basic idea there is that you really, first you calculate what is needed, and only after that you start the system design. And system design is to, uh, done use tools which are really uh, calculating for the, the duct sizes, air, the pressure losses, air, uh, sound levels, and so forth. So the designer is basically just looking at the routes where you want to have the, the ducts and, and where you put the different equipment. And as a consequence, because this is based on real product information, you really get the facility management information database. And then you can start serving your customer also in the maintenance of the 
And this has changed the business model of that company. They are not just traditional building services designers. They are life cycle information managers who are managing the technical systems of their clients and reporting how well they are uh, meeting the requirements. Uh, then, of course, you can go further, like Martin Fisher in his keynote in, in the CIB World Congress told on Monday, that when you have this kind of traditional way of looking alternatives, you can never be sure that this is really the best performance that you can achieve. It's, it might be good, but there might be something that would be even better, but you can't be sure unless you really start doing uh, the, the things in different ways. So he has been developing uh, at the Stanford a system, or one of the PhD students have been developing a system where you start automating the, the uh, calculations of alternatives. So it's automatically creating different alternatives and calculating, trying to, to find the, the best solution. So optimizing that, in this case, it's really looking at the, the CO2 levels and, and costs. And then uh, as an end result, you will get a map of the different alternatives, and as, as we can see, there are some alternatives that are performing better than the, the ones that, that they manually were implemented. This is, I, I believe that this is definitely the, the direction where we are moving to uh, in, in the future, but what makes it complicated is that it's usually not just two things that we have to optimize. The optimization of the whole building is a very complicated issue. Because we have to, it's, it's not just thinking about what is the best dis, uh, design and construction alternative. We have to also start thinking about the functions in the building. This is an area where I see a huge amount of need for, for research, really optimizing the building for the functions. In some cases, like airports, we can do that already. On, on some level, we can really start looking at the uh, flow of people, how efficient the building that we are designing will be for the purpose. But if we are speaking about office buildings, we are not at all there yet. There are some first research that, that try to start looking at people's behavior and, and really how well the, the building is serving the, the purpose. But that's where the big value is. These numbers are coming from uh, one UK study that was looking at uh, that if, if the construction cost is one, the design is typically something like 10% of that. In 20 years time frame, operations and maintenance is something like three to five. And then the, the business value in, in the building uh, is something like 4,200. And if you can improve this by better building design, that is really something where we are creating the added value for our customers. And this, is, this makes it complicated. We really have to consider very many things when we are speaking about optimizing the buildings. Otherwise, it's, it's again, sub-optimizing. We are optimizing some, only some features of that. I have been speaking about uh, some of the, the things that we have now, but of course, the question is that how far we are now? Are we there? I think the first uh, question is to really ask that we do have these tools, but do the designers really use the tools? So are we including the sustainability analysis in, in our project, in our standard workflow? Are we using the tools so early that we can still make changes in that? Or are we just simulating the building before we build it so that we verify what, what is there, but, but too late to, to make major changes? And are we sure that the uh, typical designers know how to use these tools correctly? Then do the clients really make their decision based on that information which is coming there? Or are they still just buying the cheapest building they can have, not really looking at that? What is the environmental impact of that or what is the life cycle cost of the, the building? And then, of course, a very important question is that if we predict uh, the performance of the building, are they really behaving the way as we have been saying? My personal view is that answer to all, all of these questions is no. Most, in most cases, we do not do this. There are a few very good companies, very good projects that have been doing this, but in general, in our industry, we are not doing it as, as in my opinion, we should. And one example of that, that there has been lately quite a lot of criticism against lead. A lot of lead buildings in the United States are 
behaving much worse than they have been, what has been the promise. In, in fact, as, as you can see, that average lead buildings are using more energy than comparable non-lead buildings. It's quite astonishing result, but it's true. Why that happens, there can be different reasons. It might be that the people don't use the buildings in the right way. It might be that the systems have been not built as designed or not configured as they should have been. It might be that the simulation software is, is working wrong. It might be that the person doing the simulation has not been able to use the tools. It's difficult to say what is exactly the reason, but nevertheless, the situation is so that, that there are far too many examples where the buildings are not behaving the way that we have been promising. And, and of course, one thing that we have to do is we have to start also following what happens there, really measuring how the building is really behaving and then optimizing the systems in the real use of the building. This example is Senna Properties' own headquarters where they, they were able to, to decrease the energy consumption by 30% in four years just by following and, and fine-tuning the, the systems in the buildings. So quite significant savings in that. Then. Uh, my basic last question is that, okay, is this important for your business or your, fu your future? And uh, I want to use a classical example of what can happen if you ignore the change in the marketplace. Kodak was the company inventing digital camera in 1975, as you can see. But the management didn't want to, to develop that because they saw that if that can be developed, it will be killing the film, which was their golden goose. So they just kind of buried that down. And then when 19, uh, or in 1990, well, let's say 1990s, when digital cameras started to come to the marketplace, it was too late for them. They were not able to change. And as you can see, the, the profit was dropping really dramatically. In 1888, it was still a very profitable company. And in 2009, it was really making huge losses. And, and last year, it made a bankruptcy. So Kodak, as we know that, it doesn't exist as a company anymore on the consumer market. So this is, I think that this is a very good example of that, what, what will happen. And personally, my feeling is that PIM is similar type of transition, that those companies who do not move in that, they will lose their market. It's not necessarily happening as fast as, as this moving from film to digital happened, but, but it will happen anyway. So the future is something that, that if, if construction companies, designers want to stay on the marketplace, they have to consider what is happening there. And this, this is, of course, something which is also a very important challenge for the educational institutions, that we have to be able to educate the people for the future. And it's not the same world where we were educated in, in our past. So my last slide, my, one of my favorites is this, this Japanese poem that vision without action is daydream and action without vision is a nightmare. Implementing BIM without understanding what you want to achieve by that can lead into very bad results in the companies. So really, BIM is a tool, it's not a goal, and you have to define what are the goals that you want to achieve by, by the use of the tool before starting using that. Thank you.